All right. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, so we want to talk this morning uh, mainly about NectarNet. Um, and we just took it out of beta and uh, some other various questions that, that came up around the launch of NectarNet. So the first one is, uh, how much NCT can I make? Um, and the answer to that right now is that we've allocated uh, $1,337 worth of Nectar per day. That's based on the, uh, the sort of the Coinbase price of the day in Nectar. And we basically evenly divide that up amongst participants uh, who are generating and sending data from their browser extensions during the day. Uh, the reason for that is during the launch period of this, uh, we wanted to establish the ability to gather all this passive, passive DNS data. Uh, we wanted to tie, or we wanted to uh, to be able to generate this data. Um, we are starting to tie some of that data to hits um, in PolySwarms, what we think of as our intelligence graph. And what that means is if you can imagine all the malware that we're seeing on a daily basis, the half a million to a million samples per day, our engines are detecting whether or not things are malicious, and we're also sandboxing that malware and looking for the ways that malware basically phones home, connects back to the internet, do various nefarious things. Uh, so as we look at how this malware connects back to the internet, um, we are also looking at data generated by Nectarnet users and trying to associate that data to this, this malware that we're processing. As we're able to do that, uh, we basically give Nectarnet users uh, greater rewards if their data matches both a piece of malware that we've processed and something that our customers are interested in. So we're going to start shifting the bulk of that rewards pool to those users that have identified you know, actual threats in the wild, as it were. So I said previously, you can kind of think of this as a Pokemon Go for, uh, for malware and threat intelligence. We, we really do mean that. And one of the things we're trying to do is, is sort of highlight what are the rare Pokemon of the malware world and reward people based on when they contribute intelligence to those, uh, those findings. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the summary of, of how much NCT one can make. The answer is it's evenly divided amongst the current rewards pool per day, which is $1,337. And it's going to be shifting a bit more towards, um, you know, people that spot rare and interesting threats in the wild will, will receive outside portions of that pool. So the next question is pretty related. Um, it was, where do the tokens I earn come from? And the answer from that is, uh, at the moment, our project, uh, we're taking a proportion of our subscription fees and putting them into the marketplace. We're also using some of the project tokens we had on reserve for those purposes or purposes to fund the rewards pool. However, uh, we do think this is quite a sustainable model. And so going forward, we'll be continuing to use a proportion of customer subscription fees and put them into the rewards pool, which basically means that the rewards pool can can grow, you know, based on on how our customers are using the data and whether or not they're finding value uh, beyond the initial amounts we put in. The next question is uh, also related: and how long will the uh, the one thousand three hundred thirty seven dollars a day rewards last? And how much are you committing to launching the adoption of the extension? So the the answer is that we've committed to at least a year of this. We have we have pretty sufficient funds for that, and then we are also ramping up the subscriptions in this area as well. So again, the answer is this should be sustainable over the long run, and this is especially true because Polyswarm is one of the few crypto projects uh, that has blue chip customers out there. We've already established a real use case for the data that our engine community is generating about malware. Uh, we hope to do this as well for the NectarNet users and the data they're generating through the browser extension. That's both today and tomorrow. We have some plans for the browser extension on, on how we can more actively get our community to sort of participate in this threat hunting in the wild. But what's really key in the, the initial browser extension is making sure our customers are getting the right kind of passive DNS data. And we're, we're, doing, we're having a lot of conversations with our existing and prospective customers about how uh, they use this data today. And we're trying to evolve their usage so they're better and faster at detecting you know, new malware, uh, command and control, as well as um, infection vectors in the wild using this data. Uh, so next question on top of that. Do I earn tokens even if I don't provide relevant browsing security data? So we did establish this earlier. Yes, there is a proportion of the pool set aside currently for people that are just providing data. And one of the big reasons for that is sometimes we don't know the day of what data is actually useful for identifying uh, 
you know, malware command and control infrastructure, what domains are actually malware command and control infrastructure, you know, and what domains are involved in this command and control infrastructure. Sometimes it's only when we receive a sample and process it. And sometimes this could be a few days later uh, than the actual infrastructure has been alive for. Do we understand that something a NectarNet user contributed is actually related to a piece of malware that we're looking at right now? So that's kind of the, the, the answer. Yes, you do receive rewards, even if you don't provide uh, relevant browser security data today, because we don't know, A, if that's going to be relevant tomorrow. And B, we want to encourage people to provide uh, as much passive DNS data as possible, especially during the early days of, of NectarNet here. So next question, what are some of the latest features that are now available with the removal of the beta title? Uh, really, the big one is withdrawals. Withdrawals is the key here. We're going a bit slow here. We are you know, approving withdrawals and allowing them to happen. But we want to make sure that our, um, our withdrawal infrastructure and everything else uh, keeps up with demand, uh, which has been quite healthy so far. So we expect more users and, and reward potentials uh, in the coming months. And I'll explain a bit more about what I mean by reward potential here, but specifically it's it's different use cases and different types of rewards that we may announce in the coming months, as well as a potential expansion of the reward pool itself. So that leads into our next question, which is what are some of the future functionalities that we're looking forward to? And, and this goes a bit in depth with some of our conversations. We've had a lot of interesting conversations with customers to use NectarNet and this community that we're building, this intelligence gathering about malware. And a good one of these use cases that we've heard a few times is validating that something is still actively a piece of malware command and control or um, active in malware delivery. We're working out a bit better uh, what our customers mean by that and how to do it in the context of what we've built with NectarNet. But just to illustrate what the what the problem looks like, one of the big issues in, in today's internet is that one can go online and buy you know access to a, a digital ocean server or an Amazon server and then create a bunch of malware command and control around that server. Um, what that means is that for a period of time, there can be domains associated with it. Uh, you know, uh, like, you know, badmalware.com or whatever, as well as specific IP addresses associated with that command and control. Infrastructure. It could happen that the security teams at these companies in DigitalOcean or in Amazon realize that this is being used as, as malware infrastructure and actually take it down or disable the service. So what that means is that the IP associated with that domain may no longer be malicious. That IP address may be get it may get recycled and used by a server that is has completely benign purposes, um, and it's used by a, a completely different person than um, than the previous one. So one of the real big use cases for NectarNet here is identifying when these command and control infrastructures have changed and identifying this from several different geographic locations. Uh, so we're pretty excited about adding uh, that piece of functionality and you know doing it in a way such that our our customers can sort of identify the fluctuations in command and control infrastructure. Uh, so that's one of the big use cases we're, um, we're, we're thinking about and thinking about how to implement and reward. And, and that's, uh, you know, uh, another question we have is what will you guys be working on next now that we are out of beta? And, and it's, that's one of our main answers to it. All right. Um, so the next question was, uh, we've, heard a lot, we've heard a lot about staking and even a burn feature being added at some point in the future. Have you thought about what that might look like, aside from what is what is in the white paper? We've thought a lot about uh, you know what staking and what burning could look like in the NectarNet approach. But one of the we very quickly realized as we put together some of these use cases that we needed actual data about the passive DNS data that we were already gathering. How many users are participating? From what geolocations? How often does this data? Uh, marry up with both customer requests and our malware intelligence graph, all these things. One of the big issues with this is that we also wanted to understand that if other users uh, within NectarNet are staking, they need to be able to understand where is a good place to stake, um, what does that mean for their Nectar, you know, how might those stakes uh, stand, earn rewards, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really in the data gathering phase at this point, and we've got a lot of good response so far. But we hope to add staking and burning, um, you know, in the next couple quarters, uh, at least a better idea of what that's going to look like uh, to our roadmap and communicate that with the community. But we're in the data gathering mode first. I think put more succinctly, we want to be able to, to give people uh, good ammo 
to make the good staking decisions is, is what we're talking about here. So next question, I see that withdrawals are in NCT. How are you paying the gas fees or is it actually being paid for in Nectar? So currently we're charging a fixed amount of NCT for withdrawals right now to cover our gas fees. We'll likely move to a more dynamic model over the next few weeks. And by, da- by dynamic, I mean that we will uh, likely be calculating gas fees at withdrawal time and, uh, and, and sort of dynamically pricing those in, in NCT over the next few weeks. But I know it's something the teams are actively working on right now in order to get you guys the you know, better possible pricing for, uh, for withdrawing um, NCT and, and the gas that's going to cost. So next question, what token news do you have to share regarding the mainnet transition? So we've moved all the engines over to mainnet, um, actually about 80% of the engines. The remaining 20% that haven't been moved over yet, uh, we've at least attempted to move them over and discovered bugs or things we needed to work with uh, with the engine providers. And if you can imagine that scaling across 55 engines, um, you know everybody's got uh, different priorities. Everybody in the malware landscape is very, very busy because of the Russia-Ukraine conflict right now. So the communication between those remaining 20% of the engines and us uh, sometimes takes a little time. But the vast majority of the engines have been moved over and can operate on mainnet. The second piece to understand is that we're slowly um, you know, testing, well, methodically, not so much slowly, we're methodically testing moving 100% of our load over to mainnet. We've quickly approached this number in tests and identified a few areas um, you know, where we want scalability to work a bit better. And so we keep sort of bursting up to that 100% load number and coming back down you know, for, for short bursts of time. So we expect that transition to be complete within the next quarter, but we're not overall concerned on, on how long it's taking uh, because we want to be really methodical. And we still have the ability to process all of those malware samples for our customers you know, between the two, between the two testnet and mainnet configurations. You know, we, we were asked also about, um, you know, token transactions and, and who's making or who's doing well on the engine side. So we've seen some really compelling evidence that the small engine providers are actually doing quite well in token transactions. I won't call them out by name specifically, but I know uh, there's a few engines out there that are, that are making, you know, uh, significant amounts of nectar, say half a million nectar um, by operating on the uh, the platform. We've also seen really good results as, as far as malware detection from certain engines. And I'll call out the Proton folks right here. Their engine seems to be pretty good at identifying some early stage malware that's pretty close to day zero. So that's really encouraging to me and, and some of the other uh, co-founders who originally wrote the white paper because we posited all the way back, um, you know, at the end of 2017, that um, we would see these niche engines written by, you know, individual or small teams of experts uh, that would be really good at detecting, um, you know, malware very close to day zero. Um, and we're starting to see that play out. And that's really cool for us. So it's nice to see that the uh, the theory and the initial white paper is actually becoming a reality. So the next question is, is one that's probably, uh, you know, the most difficult to answer. How long after mainnet has made a full 100% transition before we see a notable amount of buying pressure? I can't answer that. And as tradition, I don't speculate on price or volume. I really couldn't tell you. You know, there's a famous J.P. Morgan quote where, where somebody, a newspaper reporter, asked him, he said, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Morgan, what do you think is going to happen in the markets tomorrow? And he famously said they will fluctuate. I think the same thing is going to happen here. So I, I'm not really sure, you know, how the market, you know, will react on 100% full transition to mainnet. Again, though, we're about 80% of the engines on mainnet. You know, the remainder still have various bugs. So we discussed that as already. And, you know, we've gotten some great response from, from smaller engine developers as we've moved, you know, over to mainnet. Um, and they're actually earning significant portions of Nectar. So I'll pause here for a second. I'm going to go back to the chat here. If users wanted to put up their own coins slash rewards for the hunters, would compensation be rewards to the lender? So what's under consideration currently is basically staking against rewards or Nectarnet uh, users, right? So if you think there's someone that's uh, particularly good at spotting new threats in the wild and relating them back to our customers... You know, there's some interesting signal both to our customers and the Polysform team. If someone stakes nectar on on a user that's consistently finding new threats in the wild, 
you know, we think that's valuable uh, because it gives us a lot about signal about who's consistently finding threats in the wild. And it also uh, provides an economic incentive for all parties to, to keep doing so. So we really like that idea. We've thought about doing this for the engines as well. Uh, the big trouble with doing this for the engines is that um, uh, it might be a little uh, harder to understand the technology behind engines that make it so that make them so compelling and so good at detecting malware. Um, but we're actively thinking about that as well, uh, staking on engines. Beyond mainnet and nectarnet, uh, will there be any more use cases for NCT? So the answer to that is yes, but not in the way you asked it. So we think there are several more active use cases for nectarnet. What I mean by active is if any of you have ever used the Braze browser, oftentimes you get pushed, you know, effectively ads, but they're they're really requests for your attention. And for giving the attention to that ad or answering that request, uh, one receives a small amount of, of bat or basic attention token, right? We have a similar construct or, or mode with, with Nectarnet, right? This idea that customers, if they're actively hunting or searching for a threat in the wild, can push out requests to, to this distributed fleet of Nectarnet users and get those requests fulfilled. Things like, hey, you know, in the middle of Russia, does Google.com resolve to something other than a Google-controlled IP address? Uh, Nectarnet users um, are, in some cases, very uniquely positioned to to answer that request. And, you know, we, we think that's useful. So we're working on use cases like that that allow the user and their browser extension to be a bit more active in helping our customers with threat intelligence and being able to be rewarded actively. So that's the big use case and the big time, you know, that, that we're that we're using to think across that use case and really interact with our customers. But what's really helpful right now to those interactions is showing them the growth in Nectarnet, showing them the geographic diversity and people that are participating and having that data on hand in order to be able to get them to visualize the future use case and how powerful of a tool this could really be in both of the fight against malware and the, and the th sort of threat actors that are out there leveraging their malware. <laughs> so this, the, another question, will Polyswarm merch be purchasable with NCT tokens? All buys could go to a reward burn promotion program. Um, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll have the team get back to you on that. Uh, but I will say at Black Hat, the, uh, you know, the, the tiny cinder blocks uh, and gold chains were were quite popular, so I see, I see the point. Um, that could be that could be significant. It seems like the worldwide demand for literal blockchains is only increasing. Yeah. So the next uh, another question: Could Nectarnet autom be automatically integrated with Brave, Explorer, Safari, etc. The Polys One Shop. So I'm gonna check. My, my knowledge is not extensive on Internet Explorer because I uh, don't, don't use it. The answer for Brave and Safari. Uh, is pretty direct. I believe Brave and Safari both support Chrome extensions. I do not know if we've made the correct compatibility mods uh, on Safari yet, but I'll, I'll double check. It, it should be compatible out of the box, but I haven't personally tested it. So the, the answer is yes. As far as the automatically integrated, I believe in most extension installs, the user has to choose to install that extension. One might be open to the idea of, you know, if if the Brave, uh, if we spoke with the Brave teams, you know, integrating Polysform's uh, Nectarnet piece in there as well, you know, installed from the factory. But I, you know, I, I leave it to a discussion between the teams, uh, you know, as to whether or not that happens. Will there be further updates to the status page? It would be great to have more data in real time. I think there, and that's in the roadmap somewhere. Um, to be blunt with you, uh, the teams are very, very busy uh, working on additional use cases and modes of operation for Nectarnet. Uh, so we're, you know, I, I don't think that's sort of immediate in the priority stack. There'll be an app for a phone that has the same function that the Chrome extension does as a lot of people surf on their phones these days. The short answer to that is we've, we've taken a look at that pretty extensively and extension gets hard. Extensions get hard on iOS specifically, uh, which is where a lot of the a lot of the browsing traffic comes from. Things are a bit easier on Android, but you know we, we're really looking to the early data um, to see uh, you know how much we want to move to mobile. It would interest you to know that a lot of the a lot of the query traffic that we see against malware on Polysform 
is, is actually focused on, on desktop targeted malware. So while a lot of people do surf from their phones, a lot of customers are very, very interested in malware that affects enterprise computing, which is mainly desktops and not as much mobile this, these days. So we're trying to figure out if the, the mobile app really fits what the, what the users are looking for. So the, the short answer is it's in the roadmap, but the initial data will basically tell us where in the roadmap it is. Yeah. So are there mainly, are there many individuals building engines to join the PS marketplace? It currently seems to be mainly well-known companies. I would say a full 30% of the engines that are operating well on the marketplace today are from small teams. And if you would ask our customers if they've heard of some of these engines, the answer is no. So, you know, I guess the majority are probably from well-known companies. We're, we're seeing increasing market share go to small teams and individuals. Um, I don't think that, you know, we're, we're starting to see more word of mouth as well, uh, where the small team guys are coming in, um, especially since Nectar was listed on Coinbase. Uh, you know, it's a, um, it's a lot fr more friendly of an experience for those uh, engine developers to actually monetize their creations. But one of the big reasons we built uh, Nectarnet and the browser plugin in the first place was this idea that, you know... <laughs> Software developers that also develop antivirus engines is a pretty, pretty small audience of, of, of people. Um, however, uh, internet users that um, have a web browser and uh, can really help identify, um, you know, threats in the wild, that's a much bigger pool of users. Uh, so one of the reasons we really built Nectarnet and the second use case uh, for Nectar, the second broad category of use cases. Um, is that we wanted to to address that that average user, uh, so that's that's really where we think a lot of the growth is going to come from. And um, we've had uh, we've had a pretty good response from the customers so far. And you know they they simply haven't heard other innovations like this from other cybersecurity companies. <laughs> uh, will there be an extension of Nectarnet into something like the Pi-hole DNS server where you can expand collection to IoT devices? That's a great question. So we've considered that. Um, again, this is one of the cases where we're looking at the initial data that's coming back from the browser extensions. Because, and, and one of the other reasons for not doing this sort of bulk data collection or allowing people to do this bulk data collection directly is we think um, some of these more active use cases that will go into the browser extension. And by active, I mean, you know, examples where uh, users will be pushed a request to either resolve a domain or, you know, help provide some other bit of intelligence about some, you know, potential infrastructure on the Internet. Those are more active and they don't fit well in something like the Pi-hole DNS server, which for you, those of you who aren't familiar with what our, our friend is talking about here, it's a, it's a small device you put on your network, sort of like a router. It manages all your DNS traffic for, say, your house or your wireless network, which means anytime you're, you go to visit google.com and resolve an IP address, that DNS server that you put on your network is doing that. But it's also looking into a whitelist and a blacklist of, of, DNS, or of, of, of uh, DNS addresses and doing things like ad blocking, blocking malicious domains, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's what the Pi-hole DNS server is. Yeah, I'll, I'll address the uh, the SPAC question. Is the SPAC still alive, still a possibility to grow? So, yes, the SPAC is listed. It is since uh, de spac and uh, acquired uh, NARF Industries. Um, and I think that's all the public information I can share at the moment. Um, as you know, as a, as a public company and uh, being involved with that, um, I, I can't share anything that's uh, that's not already public. Uh, could you please give us an update to the marketing strategy you have in place to promote the use case to more customers and penetrate more aggressively to market? Marketing strategy. I, I'm not going to get too much into it. We just, I discussed previously, uh, we have a lot of conversations ongoing with both prospective and existing customers, both about how they will leverage the data that's already being generated by Necronet, but also the additional data and additional active use cases uh, we can uh, we can implement for them. Uh, so that on the customer side is, is how we're promoting it. And with our prospective clients, we're also digging very deep into their current usage of passive DNS data and their need for things beyond passive DNS data um, to, to generate and inform those use cases. On the user side, um, you know, obviously, uh, 
you know, we're encouraging people to download and install the browser plugin, not only because they get rewarded for providing data and doing so frequently, but also, you know, because it's it's effectively the, the right thing to do to sort of help, you know, fight the emergence of certain malware strains on the internet. Additionally, beyond that, uh, we, we are doing some some marketing efforts to make people aware of the extension um, and how it works and how it functions. But I'm not going to get into those in, in too much detail um, at the moment. Is there plans for using Nectarnet data with engine scans for data enrichment similar to VT charts? If you want to clarify that a bit, I can probably answer it. But I'm I'm not really sure like the the direct tie-in. Do you have any specific type of data talking about there? I mean, one potential use is we we often extract command and control IPs and domains via our sandboxing efforts on malware samples. You know, one could see validation of those command and control addresses via the Necronet plugins. Um, so if you had a, you know, had validated communication path from different geolocations, uh, that could be reward worthy. Sure, that's one of the one of the things we're looking at. And the idea behind that would be the reason it would be reward worthy is that there's a Nectarnet user out there that's that's helping validate two facts: one, that some malware command and control infrastructure is probably alive, and two, that it's that it's reachable from a from a geolocation uh, that they are, which is often interesting to our customers. Okay, so Fort Key says might be irrelevant, but my background is in shipping. No, it's pretty relevant which is very much affected by cyber attacks, it would be a very good sector to look into with service providers like NMRSAT, et cetera. So yeah, um, if you have any specific uh, you know, leads or users of the platform, happy to, happy to see those in a, a DM. Um, and thanks for the question. A, a few things about that. One, uh, we see any, any company with a logistics or sort of a sort of a, a daily operational tempo where if some ransomware operator disrupts them, you know, everything goes to hell very quickly. We see those uh, those companies and those entities uh, very interested in polysource data, specifically because we collect a fair amount about the ransomware. Uh, you know, we, we, we both collect a lot of ransomware directly, and we also collect the malware that's responsible for getting that ransomware onto network. And we do a lot of things that help our customers identify those attempts and stop them. And so <clears throat> one, of the, one of the big ways um, that we do this is identifying additional facts about that infrastructure, like how those actors, those threat actors, the ransomware gangs are actually communicating uh, with ransomware or implants they have on the target network and allowing our customers to basically get those IP addresses, domain names, et cetera, and, and do different things like block them or identify infections. Uh, so yeah, I agree with you that shipping is very affected by that. Um, we see a lot of interest from clients in that sector, as well as uh, second order interest from other, what we call MSSPs or managed security solutions providers. So these are like outsourced uh, cybersecurity specific IT organizations that take care of large shippers and large clients like that and are tasked with actively protecting their network. And they do a lot of this with Polyswarm's data. Yes. So directly addressing your question, not sure if it was asked, but when can we expect 100% mainnet? Uh, like I said, we're doing consistent tests where we're bursting our traffic up to 100% on mainnet um, and then scaling it back down within the intraday period. Uh, so I think it's reasonable to expect, um, you know, by the by the end of the year, we should be largely there. I'm giving that longer time frame because our tech team works pretty hard on this, and we've got a lot of users on the platform, uh, customers that expect it to be reliable. Uh, so we want to make sure that when we when we scale up, it's not sacrificing the the user experience of the. The customers that are actually need the platform for their for their sort of daily protection routines against or you know for their users. All right. Well, I think that's sort of the raft of questions for the day. Uh, thank everybody for listening. I'm uh, you know very very pleased uh, with how things are progressing um, and how the company and and Nectar is doing um, in this sort of crazy you know, extreme market, both with the Russia-Ukraine conflict and, and all that's going on in the, uh, in, in the crypto world. 
So I'm always pleased to see that. Appreciate you guys, the community, for for showing up and asking all these questions. You know, there's always some good questions in there that that force us to go, huh, we need to think about that one a little more, or maybe we should think of this, um, you know, in addition to what we're already doing. So always appreciate the questions. I, I learn at least one new thing every time I read them. Uh, listings, how does that work? Do we mean exchange for listings? I'll answer one more here. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Maybe maybe this will be a little bit of a flippant answer for, for the end question. So how do exchange listings work? The answer is all over the map and with no clear method to the madness, and it largely depends on the exchange. So I think the important thing for this community to realize is in many, in many and most cases, Polyswarm does not control the exchange listing process. Coinbase is a great example. We were told we were going to be listed in the next like 12 hours before it happened. So we didn't know much about the exchange listing process actually happening to us there. Um, other exchanges are similar. Clearly, my team you know pays attention to when they happen, mainly because we need to make sure operationally that we're able to you know support everything that's going on with Nectarnet and the engines and actually getting our customers the data they need. So anytime there's an exchange listing that could impact you know either um, either busyness on the Ethereum network or uh, you know fluctuations in the token, whatever, we do get, try and keep on top of that. Uh, but to answer your question, there's no clear process. And, you know, one of the most frustrating things my team faces on a daily basis is I'm sure Blake gets contacted all the time by people, you know, claiming to be representatives for Exchange X or Y on Telegram. And so just sorting through the, you know, who's an actual exchange employee slash participant and who's not from a project point of view is is super difficult and super time consuming. So <laughs> if I had to succinctly answer your question about how exchange listings work, I would say not very well. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm going to uh, depart. I'm going to head to my next meeting. All right. Thanks again, guys. Talk soon.